All right, let's explore more autistic history and the autism wars. This is part 78 of a series. All right, we're jumping right back into ABA history over on the Autism History Project located on uorgan.edu. You can find it under the entry Applied Behavior Analysis or give it a Google and it'll pop up for you somewhere and you can find this resource and read it if you so desire. So I'm gonna jump back where I left off speaking about B.F. Skinner. So Skinner became a lightning rod for controversy when he turned his attention from pigeons to people. His utopian novel, Walden II, 1948, explored what a society based on behaviorist principles might look like. And Skinner's fictional society, social arrangements were engineered by a committee of planners. The result was that people were peaceful. The result was that people were peaceful and happy. They worked four hours daily and devoted the rest of their time to creative and leisure activities. Moral and religious objections to the novel surfaced quickly. How could a good society flourish without free will? Was there any place for spirituality if nothing fundamental separated humans from other animals? Questions like these were responsible for the reluctance to embrace behavioral techniques in the real worlds of education and medicine. Wouldn't treating autistic children like rats and pigeons turn them into automatons and deprive them of their essential human dignity? How could an approach that circumvented thinking and feeling possibly work? What would it mean if it did? Behaviorism was often accused of being mechanistic, soulless, and anti-ethical to freedom, but it was still very tempting to apply it to humans, especially in cases where difficult and dangerous behaviors had resisted other methods of change. Children with mental retardation were among the first subjects of reinforcement techniques. In 1948, psychologist Paul Fuller described oh, these children as, quotes, vegetative human organisms mm, who were behaviorally speaking considerably lower in the scale than the majority of infrahuman organisms using used in conditioning experiments dogs rats cats adults with Mental illness were typical subjects, too. One article often cited as a landmark in the birth of ABA described how nurses in a large Canadian hospital, state hospital, became behavioral engineers as they managed adults with schizophrenia according to behavioral principles. <sighs> Such experiments dis Such experiments demonstrated that even such low human beings can learn. All right, we're in 1960. In 1960, Charles B. Furster and Marion K. DeMeyer were the first to conduct behavioral experiments with autistic children who were often also labeled as mentally retarded. Their achievement was to show that institutionalized autistic children did respond to environmental reinforcements, albeit very slowly. Furster was a psychologist at Indiana University who had worked in Harvard's Pigeon Lab with B.F. Skinner and then with chimps in the Yerkes Laboratory of Primate Biology. DeMeyer was a psychiatrist at the Indiana University and director of Children's Services at the LaRue D. Carter Memorial Hospital, a state hospital in Indianapolis. It says here, Furster and DeMeyer put children in a room with a coin dispenser after training them to press a key on the dispenser to obtain coins. Much as Skinner had trained pigeons to peck for food, 
The children used them in vending machines holding desirable objects, candy, trinkets, picture viewers, phonographs, telephone sets, and color wheels. All right, it says left alone to make their choices. Candy turned out to be the most popular. So Furster and the Meyer used candy as reinforcement during the rest of the experiment. All right, so by dispensing candy at varied times and frequencies, they deliberately changed the children's behavior. Their findings summarized in detailed graphs and tables indicate at, the, indicate at least the existence of normal processes at a very basic level. If the same laws that regulated all human learning applied to autistic children, then it was theoretically possible to train those children to do and not to do all kinds of things. So other behaviors were inspired to expand on this work. Dickie, a child diagnosed with childhood schizophrenia, was another subject of operant conditioning in the, ner in the early 1960s. After a variety of drugs and physical restraints failed to alter his challenging behavior, Dickie was admitted to Washington State Hospital at the age of three. Three, ver three researchers at the University of Washington Institute of Child Development designed a behavioral program to reduce Dickie's tantrums and help with his sleeping and eating problems. Dickie had also had a number of eye operations which required him to wear glasses, ref something he refused to do. Utilizing behavioral approaches, the researchers succeeded in modifying all of Dickie's problem behaviors over a three-month period of time. A more manageable Dickie was able to return home as a new source of joy to members of his family. Thirty years later, Todd Risley, one of the researchers, visited with Dickie. He was living independently in Portland, Oregon, working as a part-time cu custodian in the apartment complex where he lived. Of all the behaviorists interested in autism, Ivar Lovis became the best known for his long-term studies of severely affected children. Lovis did his graduate work at the University of Washington, a hub of behavioral research and spent most of his career at UCLA under the auspices of the Young Autism Project. Lovis and his team designed intensive interventions, frequently lasting for months or years, to advance the linguistic and social development of children with autism. They reported dramatic success. His first research subject was nine-year-old Beth, an institutionalized child with echolalia. Lovis worked with her for a year using positive reinforcement to teach her 50 new words and experimenting with electric shocks to eliminate the self-injurious behavior. I can see the pictures flashing. It's terrible. All right, Lovis moved on to work with Chuck and Billy, two nonverbal autistic boys who were able to imitate 30 new words after 26 days of work, seven hours each day. Also, using a combination of positive and negative reinforcements, Lovis was careful to note that learning to vocalize and imitate words was one step. Using words and understanding their meanings was quite another. All right, so there's a little bit more of this article before it wraps up, and I'm going to share that with you in the next video. Uh, just a lot to process here, right? Okay, so thank you for joining me and learning a little bit more about autistic history.